All right, with it being new, go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everybody for calling in. This is gonna be the live Q&A for uh, module one. Uh, during this session, we're gonna go through the solution to homework number one, and then take questions related specifically to the homework. And then after that, if anybody has any other questions related to um, course material exercises, things like that, I'll try to get those answered and we'll go from there. So let's jump right into homework one. I was really pleased with what I saw from uh, your else middles. The vast majority of you got this 100% correct. I think the biggest issue people are running into were where to get the no failure probability. So we'll go over that. All right. So. Homework one, we were asked to draw an event tree using uh, the data that we have here, and we were asked to calculate the probability of failure. And then for our system response probabilities, we were asked to do a common cause adjustment. So you'll notice we've got four different flood levels that we're considering, and we have five different potential failure modes. So when we go to draw our event tree, we're gonna have a branch for each one of our flood levels. And then coming off of that, we're gonna have branches for each of the potential failure modes. And then because these need to be collectively exhaustive, we'll also have our no failure branch. So the project event tree should look something like this. So then to get started, we need to get our um, adjusted system response probabilities, but we'll do the intermediate step by getting the system response complements. So if you remember, the system response complement is gonna be one minus the marginal system response probability. So I'll take one minus the system response probability here for P1. And since I'm taking one minus all of these, I can simply drag and drop to complete that table. Okay, so basically we're just taking one minus each one of these probabilities. And that allow us to use some um, Excel functions when we uh, perform the common cause adjustment. It makes the calculation a little simpler. So I always recommend doing that intermediate step. So then from there, we're going to calculate the adjusted system response probability. So to do that, I'm gonna do basically De Morgan, but then I'm going to weight it by the marginal system response probabilities. So I'll start by taking one minus the product of the system response complements. So that's basically De Morgan's rule. So I've got one minus um, the probability of none of those occurring, that gives me the probability of union for all the different potential failure modes. So then from there, I need to weight it by the marginal system response probabilities. So right now I'm working in the overtopping PFM1 column for the uh, no flood. So I'll start and pick D9, multiply that by um, this term here, and then I need to divide by the sum of all of the marginal system response probabilities. And that'll get me what I need for um, that first value there. But before I hit enter, I wanna leverage how this is laid out and lock some rows and columns. So if we think about how this is gonna move, the terms that are gonna change are gonna be, as I move down a row, I would want the values to move. But as I move across, I don't want this product or this sum to move. So I'm going to lock the columns by adding dollar signs in front of these values here. And a handy way to do that is if you click within the formula and you hit F4, it'll cycle through all the different options until you get the right one. So to lock the column, you want the dollar sign in front of the, the letter. So 
I hit that, and then I should be able, if I did that right, to drag these over and then down. So what should happen is now I'm referencing, I'm doing the same De Morgan drill calculation, but I'm referencing PFM5 when I'm doing my weighting to get the common cause adjusted system response probability. Okay. So then for a given flood loading, the no failure probability is going to be equal to one minus the sum of the adjusted system response probabilities that I just calculated. Again, the reason for that is all the branches that emanate from, this, from a single chance node, all of those probabilities need to sum to one. They need to be collectively exhaustive. So once I have all the um, failure probabilities, I just take one minus that. That's the remainder, the no failure probability. Okay? So then once I have um, this row, I should be able to just drag and drop, and I should be all set. So again, for this particular, for the major flood, for PFM2, I've got the PFM2 marginal system response. I'm multiplying that by the um, to Morgan drill result, and then dividing by the sum of the marginal probabilities to weight that. Okay? I think most peop people, when we ran out of, into trouble, it was how to get that no failure probability. And that's just one minus the sum of the system response for a given flood loading. Most people got the uh, adjusted system response probabilities right, so that was good. Okay? So now that I have all the values for my event tree, now I just need to do the event tree math and the end node probabilities. So to do that, you're basically just multiplying all the values along a given pathway. So no flood and no failure would be 0.54 times 0.878. No flood PFM1, 0.54 times zero, and then so on and so forth. So I'm going to take these values from this second table and then multiply them by really any one of these three sets of flood probability. They're all the same. They're just being carried down from one table to the next. So I will take this first value here for no failure and then multiply by the flood probability. Now the flood probability is going to be the same um, for this entire row. So again, I want to lock, let's see, I want to lock the row or the column so it doesn't move on me. I do want it to go down because each row has its own flood probability. So then once I have that set, I should be able to drag and drop. And if I've done everything right, the sum of all of those, sum of all your end nodes, that should equal to one. Because remember, everything should be collectively exhaustive. So that, that's going to be true for every project of entry that you work through. If you take every single end node, your failure end nodes and your no failure end nodes, that should all sum up to one because we're getting basically every single possibility in combination. Okay. But what we're asking for here is the total failure probability. So to get that, that is simply going to be the sum of the end node probabilities that result in failure. So that's going to be all of these, the ones that are associated with our potential failure modes. So I will take some of those. And I should get a total failure probability of 2.36 times 10 to the minus 1. So to help illustrate that point, again, we want the end nodes that result in failure. So on this particular tree, those are the ones that are shown in red here. So I'm taking all these end nodes. Remember, this number is the flood probability times the system response. That gives me my uh, probability of failure for that particular uh, loading and failure mode. And then I'm going to sum them up 
across all loadings and all failure modes. So I'm adding all these red numbers together. And when I do that, I get 2.36 times 10 to the minus 1. Okay. If anyone has any questions on that specific to homework 1, feel free. You can enter in into the chat or you can uh, unmute and ask directly. Um, good, mor um, good morning, Damon. I have a question for no failure probability. Uh, 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 what I did is that I calculated the complements and the product of the complements would be my, you know, the no failure probability. The numbers are, a bit different, but they are close enough. For example, for the next one, I have 0 0.880. For the second one, I have 0 0.747. Uh, and, you know, they are pretty close, but I, I didn't do one minus some of the system responses. So I'm not 100% following your question. So how? How did you do your calculation again? Uh, for the adjusted system response probability, I calculated the complements, which is one minus each of the, for example, OT, uh, PFM1, PFM2, blah, blah, blah. And the product of that complements would be my no failure probability. The product of those complements. The complements, for example, for, for the, uh, if you look at the OPTPF M1, for example, yeah, just do it one minus each of them and then product of them for the no failure probability. No, no, not that one. The, the, your, yeah, this table, this, uh, the middle table. The middle um, table, okay. Yeah, middle table yeah, so from, yeah. I'm, I'm following now. I, I understand why they're different. So once you have adjusted them mm -hmm. and, and you try to, I guess, you know, by, by taking the complement of the adjusted system response probabilities and multiplying those together, you're not going to get the correct result. So, there, there's two different ways to do this. You can get the adjusted system response probabilities that I just did and take one minus it, or I can simply multiply the unadjusted system response complements up top, and I will get the same result. So that's what oh, I'm doing okay. here. Okay, got you. Does yeah. That make so, sense? yes, yes, it does. It does. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Yes. Because in that one you are you are eliminating the you know the you know the common you know probability you are adjusted that so I cannot do that I have to do with non adjusted you know you know thing yeah I got that yeah and and just to show people why this works remember when we're doing the um, adjusted system response probabilities we're taking the probability of union which comes from yes. De Morgan's rule. And if we did this right, I should be able to sum these up and get what I would have gotten via De Morgan's rule, which is this guy right here. Oops, need an equal sign. So basically, one minus the product of the complement. So I get the same thing. So whether I take, once I have this, if I take one minus this, you can see that that one would cancel out and it just becomes the product of the system response complements. Get this number here. So there's a couple different ways you can go through and, and get that result. All right, let's see. I think I got a comment in the chat. You calculated no fail as one minus the sum of the adjusted. Yes, that's right. 
Hey, Damon, this is Dakota. Um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. Just for the, for the last table, um, I was banging out an email a minute ago. I didn't get to see, I got, I screwed something up. Can you just walk through how you got those in the probabilities again? Yeah, sure. So basically what we're doing is I'm taking these probabilities from the second table and then multiplying them by the bud probability for a given row. So this first one is going to be 0.878 times 0.54. The next one is going to be 0 times 0 0.54. 0 0.01 times, I guess there's there's some change there that's changing that number, but um, this number times this number to get that number, and so on and so forth. So basically what we're doing in tabular form is we're just working our way through the event tree. So each row here corresponds to um, your level or set of branches within your project event tree. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. Would you, could you click on the uh, overtopping PFM and the PFM1 for end nodes? I just want to see. Okay. Let me. Okay. So again, we're, yeah. take, we're taking the flood probability and multiplying it by the corresponding adjusted system response probability for that particular flood. So then when I get down here, I'll have the third one times the third one to get that number. I'm tracking. All right. Thank you, Damon. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, I appreciate it. Very good. Any other questions? So, Damon, I had a quick question. Uh, so, depending how you set up your event tree and the way that you think about the problem is the way that you're going to calculate your end node probabilities. Is that true? I think so. Okay. Sounds good. Amen. This is Michael yeah. Schaefer. So, you're just summing the end known probabilities for multiple failure modes across a, a range of floods. And you get something like 24% chance, right? Yes. In the training, it said that the Morgan's rule provides a ceiling value for the total failure probability. Mm -hmm. And so my attempt to calculate that landed at 8.2%. And so the answer would lie between the maximum value, which is 5.78 E minus two, which is 5% or 6% and a little over 8%. And when you're summing, I don't see how summing works, especially on the vertical where you go from one flood to the next. Okay, so I think you're referring to the unimodal bound theorem, right? Uh, yes, probably. Okay, so if we were to do that, Basically, that's what, what that's saying is it, it depends on whether or not there is, I guess, um, correlation between our failure modes or not. So the answer is going to be somewhere between, I guess, the result that you get for your highest failure mode and then the, uh, re the probability of union, which we calculate via De Morgan's rule, right? So if I were to do that, 
and carry that forward, I would need the um, probability of failure for each of these failure modes, which I would calculate by the flood probability times the marginal system response for each of these failure modes, which is what I've done down here. Okay. So then to do that, we got to see which one is the high. It looks like BFM3 would be the highest. So per that, we would be saying that it'd be somewhere between 0.15 and 0.236. Now, when we adjust the system response probabilities using a common cause adjustment, right? It is eliminating the intersection by distributing it. So when I've got five failure modes, I could have one by itself, two by itself, three, four, five, all by themselves, or I could have one and two occurring at the same time, one and three occurring at the same time, one and four. So you can see how many different possible combinations there would be, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Exactly. We, we can't so, know what the number, but we can know the bounds. Well, we could calculate that out, but it would be very computationally intensive because there would be a lot of different combinations. So what common cause assumes, or what it's doing, is it's taking that intersection no. and, and then it's distributing no. them such that now I have basically mutually exclusive no. events. I, I'm not, I don't have anywhere where one and two occur together or one and three. So once all the intersections are separated, they become mutually exclusive, and then I can just sum them up. Does that make sense? It does, but I don't see how the discussion starts with calculations using the marginal system response probabilities when the interesting number is total risk, which comes off of the end node probabilities. So you've made them uh, mutually exclusive, but the risk across different failure modes doesn't add. We just do that mathematically, and that is the answer because we made them exclusive and independent. So, if we were to consider all of those different things, all the different intersections, instead of having five branches, we'd have a whole lot more. We're basically okay. saying that those intersection probabilities are not all that important because, you know, that A, they're going to be some small probability, and B, they're likely to have the same consequences as the other failure modes. So there's times when that is a, a reasonable assumption and a reasonable simplification, and there's going to be other times in practice where that's not. But I guess for this particular example, you were asked to do a, a common cause adjustment, so we're assuming that that's reasonable. Then you can just add them up. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Yes, thank you. Very good. So as we start getting into, I mean, Typically, what you'll find with um, a lot of these assessments that the intersection probability is often going to be really small. Small enough that even if we didn't bother with something like common cause adjustment or competing risk and just um, did the exclusive risk model and summed them straight up, your result is not going to change a whole bunch. Um, again, when you have spreadsheet tools, you know, that can do a lot of these calculations for you. At a minimum, you know, probably best to do something like competing risk. But then when you get into your more high powered softwares like uh, RMC Total Risk, which we'll talk about later in the course, it's got stuff set for uh, where it can do the um, joint model and do it simply for you almost no reason not to do it with the exception of 
with each of these intersections, now I got to consider what are the consequences and are they different? So basically it's just balancing the level of work to the, um, the accuracy and the precision and the final result that you need. Other questions? Just while we're, while I'm waiting to see if there is anything else, I want to show one thing just to help make my point about what we're doing. Let's see. So if you remember this slide, Again, when we are doing a common cause adjustment and even competing risks um, to some extent, we're creating mutually exclusive events. And when I have mutually exclusive events, I can sum those probabilities. So this is Michael again. Do we know that the intersections are small qualitatively? Because what we know about the different DFMs, or does that fall out of the magnitude of changes for a common cause adjustment? Or is there some other way to evaluate whether, I mean, is there a criteria mathematically for small intersections so when you go through and um, do you know uh, calculations for a risk assessment you are going to calculate the marginal risk for each potential failure mode okay which basically I've done here or look I'll show you the difference so if I take the some of these marginal results so this is ignoring the intersection and just adding them up. Again, I get a result of 0.274. In this particular instance, that difference is, you know, what is that? Point, um, so be four times 10 to the minus two. I guess in the grand scheme of things, when you're trying to um, assess the risk and make good decisions, there really isn't much difference between 27% and 24%. So again, a good way to check that, you'll always have your marginal risk when you go through it. And this will make more sense when we get through um, module two, but we'll always calculate the marginal risk for each of our failure modes. And we can sum them and compare that to, you know, the De Morgan's rule result and see, how, see what difference we get. And the vast majority of the time, it's it's pretty small and it's, um, typically smaller than what I'm showing for this made example. Excellent, thank you. Good question. Anything else on homework one before we move into something else? Hey Damon, it's, it's Dakota again. I posted a Okay. Something no, in the chat, but um, I'm gonna be there by twelve forty-five. Yeah. I think we got a hot mic, guys. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I was wondering why in your adjusted system know, response can't leave you probability yet. table. No, I just sent you a message. Yeah. yeah. Well, if um, <laughs> if you're not on mute, can you can you please be on mute if, unless you're asking a question? You get thirty minutes and get there forty-five minutes early. Yeah, but other people are going to do crazier stuff. People who are for like one. James. You think they're not going to get there an hour ahead of time? James. Yeah. James, hey, I mean, are you hosting? Because you can also mute him if you are. Kate, would you mind? There we go. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dakota. No, no worries. It, that happens to all of us. Um, I was just curious. Uh, you know, why in the adjusted system response probabilities? So, 
uh, I did it in my event tree where I separated overtopping from internal erosion. Um, and I just I was wondering why you don't do that uh, into Morgan's equation. So, you know, when you're calculating the probabilities for internal erosion, PFMs, and I guess two, three, four, and five, you know, overtopping is not one of those. So I don't, it's probably an easy answer and I'm not thinking about it right, but I just was curious. So in, in your event tree, you've got overtopping out in front here. Is that correct? Yeah. No? Yeah. So, so like for the first, for no flood risk, I've got, uh, like, uh, overtopping separated from internal erosion and then it applied that way. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so basically what you're doing is you're making overtopping basically a dominant failure mode. So when you get to the higher stages where overtopping starts to occur, we're saying that I either fail by overtopping or I don't. And then if I don't, I would have some probability of internal erosion, right? Right, okay. So yeah, so it, it's one, it, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. That is a reasonable thing to do in some instances. It's one of those things where I guess timing becomes important and um, I would say magnitude would be important too. Basically, again, what you're saying is that if we get to this certain spot and it overtops, then we won't have failure by any other mechanism. It precludes PFMs two, three, four, and five. It's kind right. of similar to what we do with competing risk. Because if you remember, you'll have, um, I guess, distinct scenarios where, you know, you've got one failure mode, but the others, we survive the others, basically. Tracking, okay. So that's basically what, it's, it's not wrong, but I would say that even though it's probably more likely that overtopping would govern, I guess there could be scenarios where you could overtop and fail by internal erosion at the same time. I guess, theoretically speaking. So, again, there's a specific paper, um, I'm blanking on the, on the name, but it's the, the paper that had, that, um, I guess, documents the common cause adjustment and within that paper, there's a discussion of failure mode dominance. And basically what you're doing there is assigning overtopping to be the dominant failure mode for those floods. And if you have a good reason to do so, like it's, you know, Sandy Levy that would happen, you know, an overtopping breach would happen very, very quickly, then that can be a reasonable thing to do within your total project of entry. Okay. Can I, can I see, what does your event tree look like when you get to moderate then? The same as it was above. That's all the, yeah. Okay. All right. Now I'm tracking. Thank you, Damon. Anything further on homework one? If not, I want to go through um, exercise 1.2 on competing risk one more time. Um, if you have a chance, can you share the paper I just referenced? Yes, let me um, try to remember who wrote it and then I'll, I'll share that. Sorry, I'm blanking at the moment. All right, let's move over to exercise 1.2. I had a couple questions that came through via email about competing risk and how to do it and what we're doing. So I've got the slide from the training here. And again, when we're, um, when we're doing competing risk, we're basically saying that we have, with as many failure modes as we have, there's 
that's how many distinct and different ways that it could fail. It's either going to fail by, in this example, A, B, or C. Okay? So, in doing that, our adjusted probability becomes the integral of our marginal system response for A times the survival function for the other failure modes. So that's going to be my SRP complement for B times my SRP complement for C. A fails, but B doesn't, and C doesn't. Okay? So when we plot all that out, remember the when we integrate, we're taking the um, area underneath the curve. And this is all with regard to our load, which is um, defined as Q in this equation. So to get the area into the curve, and when we're dealing with straight lines, it actually works out, we can use trapezoidal rule to solve that integral. And when we do that, we get um, this equation right here. And I stepped through that when we were doing um, competing risk examples. So basically, again, it's the area under my curve where I'm plotting, again, my system response for A against the um, survival function of the other failure modes. I'm trying to find this area. And that solution is going to be these right here. So again, just to reiterate some of the stuff um, and go through the calculation, again, we'll take one minus our marginal system response of each of these to get our system response complements, like so. And then I need to start stepping through using this equation right here. Um, to get my adjusted system response probabilities from competing risk. So what that's going to be is I'm going to have my um, marginal system response for my failure mode. I'm going to subtract from it the marginal system response for um, the hazard prior. And when I'm working with the first row, that's always going to be, the prior is always going to be zero. I've got C8 minus 0, and then I'm going to multiply by 0.5, and then I'm going to multiply by um, the complement for um, this first hazard. So that's going to be P2 times failure mode 2 times failure mode 3, those complements. And then I'm going to add to it the complements for, I guess, a Q0 or a hazard, a previous hazard. So that's going to be, remember, we said that those system responses are all going to be zero, so their complements are going to be one. So that would be um, one times one. And that gives me the first value. The second value, I'm going to then take my first value, because I need the full integral, and I'm going to add to it the result of using this equation again. So now I'm going to do the same thing, but now everything's going to kind of shift down a row. So I'll take the marginal system response for the hazard that I'm looking at, subtract from it the marginal from the hazard prior, and then I'm going to multiply by 0.5, and I'm going to do the same thing on the complement side. So that's going to be these two together and add to it these two, which you get should be something a little bit higher. It should slowly increase each time as you work your way down. So then if I've done that right, I can... Um, I basically just follow that same step and procedure the rest of the way down to finish out my column. Um, I can, um, I should just be able to take that and drag it down. It should be set. 
that should have worked. And then to do it for PSM2, the easiest thing to do is to take that formula. We're going to do the same thing, but now I need the marginal for PFM2, and I need the complements for 1 and 3, so I can take that formula and just move things over and reference different cells. So again, basically we're doing the same thing, but now I'm using the marginal probabilities for my second failure mode and then the complements for the first and third uh, should be set there. And then the last one would be um, PFM3, but with the complements for one and two. I think I didn't carry, I think I missed a cell on that first one. Uh, nope, we're good. Does that make sense? So the reason I bring that up is that that is going to show up again when we go through module two there's going to be basically a, an example that I work through across the entire uh, presentation. And we'll, we'll do this when we get to the total risk calculation. Um, you'll also be asked to do this again in uh, homework two. And then thankfully that's probably the last time you'll ever have to do competing risk by hand because it's built into the spreadsheet tools and then also into RMC total risk. Um, Any questions if, on? Yes, if you add a dummy row like for the system response complement one 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 and the marginal system zero 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 in the first row, you don't you don't need to like twice the formula. You ju you just can fix for one and you know drag it down. That's what I did. I just yeah. added marginal system response zero 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 and system response complement one one one. So yeah, it's just yeah yeah. Yes, that's 100% right. So what, what, what she's saying is if you wanted to, you could have just as easily put in a dummy row for what would be Q0, basically. And then you wouldn't have had to do all the um, two separate sets of formula. You could have just put the formula in one time and you would have gotten the same result. That's 100% right. And truthfully, that's the better way to do it. Okay. Any questions on that? It's one of those things where competing risk is kind of, I guess, simple in um, I guess the general understanding of what we're doing, it's kind of a weakest link approach, but once you start getting integrals and trying to solve for areas underneath curves and stuff like that, it gets kind of difficult to explain, even though it's kind of simple to understand. All right, so if no one has any other questions, let's talk about um, where we go from here. So, to get credit for participating in the uh, live Q&A, there's a, a quiz uh, out on Socrative. You see the um, URL down there at the bottom, and then we'll um, choose our student login. And then from there, you'll be prompted for uh, a room name. The room name is always going to be DLS 105 R. And then we want the 
uh, module that we're working on. So we're in module one. So for this first one, it's going to be DLS 105R1. And then it'll ask you to enter your name, uh, last name, then first name, click done, and it'll take you to the quiz. Uh, quiz is going to be uh, multiple choice and some true false stuff. Um, don't fret too much over um, the questions and whether or not you get them right. Certainly do your best. It is a learning check, but think of it as a kind of like a practice for the final exam. A lot of the questions that you see over the course of these quizzes will show up either verbatim on the final exam or um, maybe different numbers or similar concepts, just things switched around just a little bit. Um, when you take these quizzes, the very first quiz question is going to ask you for uh, the buzzword. The buzzword is just a way for me to make sure that you basically watched the entire um, the entire recording or participated in the entire session. So for module one, and you'll want to write this down, for module one, the buzzword is going to be marginal. The module one buzzword is marginal. So really that's the only question that we're um, checking to make sure you get correct. You get that correct, then you get credit for uh, the live session and we'll go from there, okay? So again, that buzzword is marginal. Um, cast that, I think you've got uh, a week or so to get that quiz completed. It shouldn't take you more than um, five, 10 minutes, nothing crazy. Um, once you get through that, um, you're free to start moving on to uh, module two. Uh, the module two files aren't up quite yet, but they should be up here soon. Um, one thing I will say about mar uh, module two is that it's it's going to be really important to us. It's just as foundational as the stuff that we just covered for module one. So we will cover how to do all the basic risk calculations. We'll cover how to do um, how to create the different plots that we're working with. Then from there, the rest of the course is going to build on it. So, for example, module three, we're going to get into some more, um, I guess, difficult examples where we have things like aid and operability, debris blockage, or earthquakes. And then when we get to module four, we'll start adding um, how we quantify uncertainty. And then modules five and six, we'll go over the different tools that will do a lot of these calculations for us. So. Um, I think there's three weeks for this particular module. And again, the reason for that is this is a really important one. So take your time um, and make sure as you're going through that you understand the concepts. Um, if you have um, questions as you go through it, by all means, feel free to email me or call me and I'll try to answer your questions. So I see a question in the chat asking how we get uh, at risk. Well, we would need at risk for module four in this go round. I think we're, we don't need it for two or three. Um, if you don't have it, I guess there's a couple different things you can try. Um, the first one would be to purchase it. It's not cheap. So um, if you can't get it, I understand completely. Um, the second option is there is a uh, free trial that they uh, list on their website that you can try to do. I think they ask for your name and some contact information and then maybe they will let you do it. In years past, it has worked for some people. Um, sometimes they're not super responsive. Um, the other catch with that is it's only good for 15 days and that starts from the moment you download it. So we would need at risk for modules four and five preferably. So if you're going to try to do the free trial route, I think you can contact Palisade now and see if they'll do it, but don't uh, install the program and try to run it until we get further along, like one week to go in module four. So you can kind of um, bridge between modules four and five when you really need it. 
if you can't get at risk, then I've created the homework for uh, module four. There's a workaround where you can, it's not perfect, but basically you would just punch in the at risk functions and if you get it right, um, the uh, spreadsheet will kind of auto populate the result that you would have gotten. Um, when you get to, um, when you get to module five and we start using RMC QA calc, there's both a probabilistic option and a deterministic option. So when we get there, if we don't have it, we would just do the deterministic. So it's one of those things where it's certainly um, preferred that you have at risk, but if you don't have it, we can work around it and we'll go from there. Um, Jim just put a note in the chat for Corps of Engineers employees. You can get at risk from uh, the app portal, but it does take an ACID ticket to try to get that uh, network license working. So I know a lot of people have been on a, um, a loop trying to get ASIC to get that on their machines too. So his advice about starting early is, is good advice. Okay. Any other uh, last second questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was uh, felt unmuted. I was uh, having a, I, I followed the instructions in the print directory for stuff to get the license server registry edit done by NISA. We did that, mm -hmm. and it's really still not working for me. I just tried to get into at risk, and it's so the, the yeah. The, the advice to you know start early and often is very good. Well, it may take a while to get basic to work with all the right stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, sorry you're having trouble. I I will say of the, I think we've been this course for several years now, and what I've learned is that the hardest thing about this course is getting at risk installed on a computer. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, I had it installed on my work computer a few years ago for the NDMU with my course, and I never did get it to work there. You know, have a student version on my personal computer, which that student version is now expired. So I'm not sure if I'm even going to be able to, to do the trial version on that same computer. Yeah, I see. Well, yeah. Well, it, it, like cool. So, like I was saying, if, if worse comes to worse, I've got workarounds where you can still kind of learn how to use at risk, but not get quite the full hands on experience that you would if you had it, but good enough to get you through uh, the different modules and credit for the course. All right, so um, that's a, well, we got more questions for um, uh, about at risk. Uh, portals requiring a license purchase. Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do if it's asking you for a, a license purchase from the portal or like, a, like I know that once you get it installed, you know, ACE it still has to do some things to your registry to get it to work. Let me start asking around because we still have several weeks before we need it. Um, and I'll try to follow up here um, within the next week or so about what the best way to go about getting it is. That's specifically for the core employees. Yeah, it does give you the option of uh, providing uh, yeah, a list that has us on a, on the list as a uh, an approved license, yes. Oh, okay. a, like an, on a group license. I think that's, I, they, uh, they would accept that. Okay. All 
All right, with that, that's a wrap for uh, the live Q&A for Module 1. Um, check your uh, course schedule, but next time we might talk would be the optional office hours if you have questions on anything related to Module 2. But if not, we'll see you in a few weeks when we do this again for Module 2. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David.